Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today we got to see Astra finally launch a rocket into space. Their rocket 3.2 had been shipped up from Alameda to Alaska. They'd spent a couple of days waiting for good weather and then today it launched. Now we didn't have live coverage. All these photos were delivered after the fact. They are, of course, photos by John Krause, who has been on hand to photograph the last few launches by Astra. Uh, what we did get at the time was live tweeting of the event. And I'm going to say they missed some important call outs because, of course, we got to hear about the launch. We got to hear about Max Q. We got to hear staging and Miko. And we didn't hear any call out about the engine lighting. And there was a lot of concern that they might not have in fact lit that engine. But eventually we got updates that were far enough down the line that we knew they must have lit the engines on that second stage. This is a beautiful image, by the way. I just love seeing that heat haze. Anyway, we do have a small amount of video from the Twitter account of Astra. The video quality is pretty potato, but you'll see the launch time is about 11.55 a.m. And it gets off the pad with a certain sense of urgency. I believe all five engines produce a thrust of about 15 tonnes. They're named the Delphine engines. They're, they use electrical pumps to pr uh, pump the kerosene and liquid oxygen. And uh, I believe they're 3D printed. Very small engines overall. The rest of the rocket, of course, is pretty small too, all made of aerospace grade aluminium. So now we get a, a switch over to show the stage separation, the fairing and the stage separation, and of course the second stage lighting up. You'll notice that the second stage, uh, the staging is happening about 2 minutes and 20 seconds into flight. Now this was posted to Twitter, another version of this just showing the stage separation from the point of view of the uh, rocket was posted to LinkedIn and it looked way cleaner. You get to see a lot more going on here. So I'm playing this in slow motion. Now that that sphere right in front, notice how reflective it is. That doesn't have any insulation on it. That is because it's the one containing the kerosene. Now the stage separation happens and this sphere has you know insulation on it that contains liquid oxygen. You'll see two sections protruding out uh, of the side. Those are supporting the thing inside the fairing. The engine comes into view. I don't see anything complicated on that engine. It looks like a very simple uh, pressure-fed engine, and that would make sense with these large spherical tanks to use pressure. During the ignition sequence, you'll see it blow uncombusted fuel through the nozzle and then it actually lights up. But also look for the gas thrusters, right? You'll see gas thrusters shooting out at 90 degrees to the thing to control roll. There, you see those? Yeah, that's the roll control. So it has a nozzle which can be gimbaled so it gives it pitch and yaw and it uses gas jets for roll. Now we don't have any other video following that right now. They may make it available tomorrow, most likely the moment my video goes live, but uh, we do have this single image showing the engine shut down eight minutes after launch. So this is the point that they ran out of propellant. Now, according to their official statements, they ran out of fuel, but they had oxygen left over. So their mixture ratio was not correct. And that possibly explained why they ended up performing below what they expected and not getting into orbit. They had too much mass left at the end and they weren't getting enough efficiency from what they were, do you know, they were, you know, burning. So I've heard they were half a kilometer per second below, but that they plan to fly a payload on the next flight without any hardware or software changes. And I'm presuming they must be changing something if they think that they're going to get into orbit. But I guess it doesn't need a change of software to fix their mixture ratio. So again, this is super slow-mo from the camera looking down. At the top, you have the fairing. So you watch, they're deploying the fairing right now and that pushes off. There's this rubbery insulation material you can see getting squished out. But now, the fairing's falling away, but we're going to look at two things here. One, you're going to look in the middle at the size of the rocket nozzle on that engine. And also, to the left and the right, you're going to see, look for the pistons that push the spacecraft apart. So when they let it go, you see these pistons are sticking out of the edge. 
I believe there's three of these that correspond to the uh, pre, you know the structural members that come down. But yeah, look at the size of that engine. It's fairly substantial compared to the size of the uh, interstage there. Now, this official footage is also good because it confirms that the image that leaked on a photo sharing site is probably the real thing. Now, to be fair, we had already pretty much figured this out from background photos in other videos, but yeah, this is the best footage we can see. Down the bottom, you can you can actually see that the engine doesn't have any pumps, so it looks like it's pressure fed. This is the Aether engine. It has two like thrust vector control units there to adjust the orientation. And of course, the stacked arrangement of the two propellant spheres with the fuel being on top and the liquid oxygen being below. We know this because one has insulation and also because of the rel relative sizes. And we know that what works well in terms of fuel uh, oxidizer ratios for kerosene and liquid oxygen. So that's what we're assuming here. So anyway, congratulations on getting this far. I hope the next flight works out. It's also been revealed that they have a contract with NASA to launch an actual satellite. So that'll be great. That'll be the, they'll be the, like the second small sat launch vehicle to actually get to space. So that's a you know, great step up from other uh, vehicles. And speaking of other vehicles, it's been a busy few days and I couldn't go by without acknowledging uh, Roscosmos fight launching their second Angora A5. This, of course, was five years since the last time they launched one of these. This was supposed to be the the bold future for Russia's rocket program. They, of course, a entirely domestic Russian launch vehicle using the high performance engines that are also found on the Atlas and the Antares rocket. This was a launch with a dummy payload which was going to be carried to geostationary orbit. They lifted off from Placet's Cosmodrome which is one of the furthest north launch sites and they had to of course get this into geostationary orbit. They had a the, the Breeze M upper stage on there to actually perform this so apparently everything worked. It's looking good for this vehicle. It's just a shame that it's taken so long. I hope their next launch happens a little more quickly. This weekend also saw the Delta IV Heavy carrying NROL-44 finally fly after a couple of failed launch attempts. This is, of course, a completely classified mission that we can, as far as we can tell, is going to geostationary orbit. And it is believed that this is carrying a radio reconnaissance satellite, which has a very large dish which will unfold. But regardless, yeah, it's great to see this fly. It's unfortunate that uh, the Delta IV ground equipment seems to be causing lots of problems with the rocket. There are only four Delta IV launches left in the calendar, and then that will be the end of all the Delta rockets. There will be two launches from Vandenberg in the next couple of years, and then two launches from the newly renamed Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, uh, ending perhaps as late as 2023. ULA is replacing both the Atlas and the Delta with their new Vulcan rocket, which should have its first flight next year. Vulcan is, of course, the first rocket that ULA has developed on its own. The previous vehicles came from their you know, progenitor companies. Now this is going to be a clean break from that past. Uh, Monday, we also had a launch of a Rocket Lab Electron. And, well, this was kind of interesting because apparently they had to delay the launch by a day because the company behind the satellite, which is a synthetic radar satellite, they realized that it was going to pass through a solar eclipse and they weren't sure how that would affect their satellite. So they delayed the launch by a day. So that's the first time I think I've heard of a rocket launch being delayed by a solar eclipse. But it was another solar effect that got a lot of notice. Uh, it launched into the twilight and we got, of course, an amazing twilight trail as the second stage uh, you know, it ejected its exhaust into the upper atmosphere, which was ilu being illuminated by the sun, producing, yeah, marvellous looking visuals for people in New Zealand. Finally, I want to talk about SpaceX. Now, of course, they had another launch as well. The, they're going to end the year with more launches than anyone else by the looks of things. Uh, and of course, they had that rather spectacular test of serial number eight. And we actually got some amazing photos from the wreckage 
from Steve Jervison, who's been a long-term SpaceX investor, and he, he uh, was actually picking up souvenirs, apparently. If you've ever watched SpaceX's How Not to Land an Orbital Rocket, there's a sequence where a rocket explodes and Elon is walking amongst the wreckage saying, oh, it's just a scratch. The guy with him is Steve Jervison. So, um... I, I do love the fact that he talked about this as being rapid, unscheduled art. And uh, specifically name checks the Flaming Lotus girls who you know, do Burning Man installations, usually with lots of fire and steel. And I imagine there's a lot of parallels with that and you know, building Starship and testing it and burning it. But I want to talk about this particular, uh, particular image. Now, a lot of people said, oh, wow, that looks like a flower. But this is the fuel header tank. This is the thing that uh, did not generate the pressures required and resulted in the uh, landing failure. And of course, we can all see that it obviously failed because there's a giant hole in the side. How are you going to get any pressure with a giant hole like that? Okay, we can't tell when that hole was made, but this is a fuel tank that sits at the bottom of the main fuel tank, right on top of the oxygen tank. And if you look around the side, there's actually these valves that can open and close. So I think what happens is these open up when the fuel is normally being consumed. And then when the main engine shuts down, they close these valves and you've got a little tank that's full of just enough uh, fuel just for the landing. Now, we didn't find out any more details about what exactly went wrong. But what we did find out was that they planned to move serial number nine to the launch pad for testing pretty much right away. And that told me that they knew what was wrong and that it didn't need any hardware changes. So, you know, there's a few things that could be they might have got their valve sequences wrong and perhaps, you know, burst a tank or something like that. Uh, it's not really clear, but the point was that they didn't need major changes to fix it. Unfortunately, this rapid turnaround was not to happen as a result of SpaceX's lean development process. See what I did there? Yeah, that wasn't planned. They ended up having to get in the, the giant crane to try and get the thing straightened out again. And it looks like one of the flaps at the front has been damaged from the fall. So that'll be a bit of a while before they can get that fixed. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.